Hello everyone, welcome to the End the Stigma podcast, episode three, with me, Paul Garrigan, from Pac Mentality. Now we're meant to have Jay Wheeler from Don't Walk in Silence. He's been unable to make it today, so it's just going to be me. And uh, we've got a very special guest on today, who's a good mate of mine. He's, um, he's doing some amazing things in the city for people's health and well-being with the positivity mindset. He started the Ultimate Morning last year. He's big into the 5am club. And, you know, he's, he's really had a big effect on people's lives and doing that in this city, especially mine, over the past year. So it is Mark Scanlon. Yeah, Mark. nice to be here. Thanks, Paul. For How are you, mate? Invite me in. Good, yeah. He's right. Um, I usually start, mate, with just a little check in. Just how things have been the past couple of weeks for you, what's been going on, you know what I mean? What's uh, what's alive for you, mate? And then we'll we'll take it from there. At the minute, all I can think about is food, because as I just told you before, <laughs> I'm, on, uh, I'm on my last day for five day water only fast, so I haven't eaten nothing since Sunday afternoon. So right. at the minute, I'm just absolutely starving, physically yeah. tired, but mentally good, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You've been um, doing much saying and that, mate, as well. Yeah, I've still trained every yeah. every morning, to be honest, and most most evenings this right. week. Done all my cold baths and everything else, what I do, my little morning routine. Yes. Um, I've had a good, I've done Martin's level two meditation, which I just mm. mentioned to you, Martin Bones, and enjoyed that last night. So yeah, I'm flying this yeah. week, to be honest. As I say, physically tired, because I'm not obviously eating anything, but mentally I'm in a good place. Yeah. That's right, brother. Good, you look, he looks good, doesn't he? Yeah, hey, thanks. You're mate. That's right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um... So I'll have a little check in, mate. I've had a, uh, I've had a week off work this week just to try and get things in order with um, with yeah. Pact. And I'm on my level four with Martin, nice. mate. Um, embodied excellence. So that's um, that's really interesting. We were in Sefton Park yesterday morning and my ankles are both swollen up, mate. They've been bit. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, mate, we've, we've had that bit. a few times. You know, we've yeah. done something with Lee Butler because um, we, when we first came off the beach yeah. and got bit and... Um, we done one on Otter's Pool Prom the other. I can't remember the name of the flies. Yeah. The only tiny aren't they? Yeah. I had them right up my legs, on my legs mm. swelled up. At, um, I had them everywhere. Mm. It's not it's nice. vicious, mate. I've got scars <laughs> off them and everything. Probably like, naughty, they are. Yeah, it's not nice, mate, is it? No. Not nice at all, mate. No. But, um, okay. So, this is a mental health podcast, if you like, predominantly for men. Yeah. So... I always try to start with the guest mates, just going back as to your earlier years, if you like, in childhood, and just, and then we'll just take it from there, mates, and we'll lean into whatever comes up. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can just start with obviously just your earliest memories, mate, of, of being raised as a man in this city. You know what I mean? Yeah. To be honest, it's hard. It's something more regularly, especially recently, I've tried to go back to, and because I think for a long time, it was if there was like, a, like I was blocking a lot of stuff out. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or intentionally forgetting some stuff, but I didn't have the worst um, upbringing. Something that definitely affected me, which I've never really spoke about. I don't think is uh, when I was two, and my mum was pregnant with me little brother. My dad, obviously, people experiment with drugs, don't they? And mm. apparently, he was minding some drugs for someone, which was heroin at the time. And um, yeah, I think he just tried it, and, and that was it. He was just he was just addicted to it, and pretty much. He's on methadone now and I think mm. he likes a drink, but he's still, till this day, he's obviously, he's an addict, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that obviously played a big part in our upbringing. My mum was left, they see to step up and she did in a big way. Yeah. Um, she weren't perfect. I'm not perfect. Yeah. You know, I'm bringing my own kids up, even with the stuff what I study every day and mm. the knowledge of what I'm very grateful to, to have now. But my mum done what she needed to do and, you know, I, I like to say, I'm pretty happy with where I am. Yeah. I'm very happy with where yeah. I am in life now. And I owe a lot of that to, to my mum, but um, I also owe a lot of that to my dad because obviously if he hadn't done what he'd done, um, then I wouldn't be where I am and who I am. So yeah. I went through it. Um, hopefully this helps people. I went through a big phase of hating them, wanting to physically harm them, um, being embarrassed by him. Like a lot of different emotions, all negative towards my dad. Um, he was away for, he actually we never seen him for 18 years and um, I was in Carbon one evening this was about 6-7 years ago and the night before I'd had, a, um, I'd had the most like this crazy like dream basically one of me I was driving down Tubaru and one of my dad's mates pulled me over in the car and showed me a picture of us when we were kids with my dad mm. and um, 
it was just like I remember just waking up, just being like, wow, I didn't even think about him. I kind of block him out in my mind most of the time. And um, he was just playing on my mind a little bit the next day. And then it was about 9.30 in the night, I coached the even class in Carbon at the time. And I was sitting on the edge of the ring while everyone was rolling. And the next thing I know, just subconsciously, I'm just on Google, searching for his name and his address and found an address what came up and mm. it was my dad because it was his middle name and um, it was the, the age stacked up. So next minute finding myself finishing the class, driving down Queen's Drive to County Road, knocking at this house, like bear in mind, I haven't seen uh, the sight of him. I, I found out actually being to watch one or two of my fights, but maybe never had the, the like the courage to come and approach me. You didn't me know he was there? Me. I didn't know he was there, no, but he'd been to watch me fight in the Olympia. Like, he worked in a garage for some, like, lads from KBU who we knew at the time, or we had mutual friends, and it just got back to me that he'd been to watch me fight. But I think when that, I was actually fighting at the time, I was obviously younger, and I think me, me view then was just like, well, you can come and watch me fight, but he can't come and knock at me door, so basically mm. fuck him, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, obviously, I've matured, matured and grown and started to look at things differently, obviously, through taking the action to go and find me dad and actually speak to him when all my emotions and feelings towards him prior to that had all been negative I blamed him for a lot of things I hated yeah. him and everything else and then the next minute I just find myself driving to find him and to go and see him so I pulls up at this house on County Road and there was a picture of a Jack Russell in the window I'll never forget it and I know he'd always liked dogs that's one thing I knew about him Yeah. so I was like this is definitely his house so I'm knocking at the door there's no answer. So obviously we're big army on what's meant to be. Yeah. No, it's meant to be, so to say. So I'm knocking for a couple of minutes. I give it maybe five minutes. I go back to my car to see if I had a pen and paper to write my number down and post it. No pen and paper in the car. So it goes, well, it's not meant to be. Sits in my car. Just as it goes to drive, a taxi pulls in in front of me. So I'm like looking like that. And the next minute just sees this little life fat fella getting out bald the head. Carrying washing out and he's on, he's on crutches. So I knew obviously it was my dad. Like he'd never had weight on him when we were younger, but I remember when he was on the gear, every time he'd come off it, he'd, or he'd go to jail or something, he'd, he'd, blew, he'd put weight on, do yeah. you know what I mean? Obviously, um, so I've seen him anyway, she's this little fat bald yeah, that fell, and I'm like, that's me dad. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, obviously it's meant to be, do you yeah. know what I mean? So he gets yeah. out, walks over, and uh, says to him, do you know who I am? And he goes, looks at me funny, he goes, Mark, that's you, isn't it? So I said, yeah, it's me, daddy, you're all right. Do you want to hand carry in your, your washing? And he goes, yeah, please. So he goes in the house. He's just living in like, like hoard. He's always loved gadgets. I remember again, when we were kids, he was into like gadgets and just basically went, walked into his living room. He's got um, like these kind of like really bad ulcers on his lower legs and he can't walk properly. So his feet swell up. So he basically lives in his living room. We lived in his living room. And uh, I goes in, there's just gadgets and just basically shit everywhere. Mm. He's got this little dog, which is like dead vicious. It's <laughs> just him and the dog. And I just sat down and started talking to him. And um, I was just asking him what, what he'd been up to. And he basically told me people who he'd been around weren't a good influence on him. And um, he'd come away from them and spent six years on his own. The only contact he had with anyone was these nurses came once or twice a week to change all the um, bandages on his legs and to clean them. And, to keep his legs okay um, but apart from that he, he hadn't spoke to no one been there anyone but he'd been on Facebook followed loads of like my family on Facebook he'd been drove out he told me he drove outside my mum's house because he knew where she lived he'd been to watch me fight so in a mad way we obviously believe in manifestation yeah. like I believe and it sounds funny but I never went and found him he basically brought me to him yeah just through thinking about me and seeing me and he said he all he ever done is speak about me and my younger brother to the, um, to the nurses who came do you know what I mean and then yeah. that was it I kind of he was back in our life um, he's still in our life now but I don't know the things like trying to um, I started getting them because I knew he just basically lived off the pizza boxes and kebab boxes yeah. and, so he was just <clears throat> eating absolute shit do you know what I mean he never drank no water he was just drinking coffees and I think he liked the drink and Mm. bottles of coke just like so we never drank virtually no water um, so I started get, be, getting a meal preps delivered on them all the time over waters me, me brother came back into his life he was running around helping him my mum came back into his life my mum just wanted she'll help absolutely anyone my mum she's like the biggest dad yeah. 
just being a downfall a lot of the times. Um, well, I won't say it's been a downfall. That's probably the, the wrong way to put it. Um, but I, I know it's definitely affected her in the past. Yeah. She's suffered because of it. Yeah. She's um, trying to look after everyone else like mums do and, world, and being yeah. empty yourself. Yeah, she's yeah. just like, she just wants to help absolutely everyone. She'll yeah. give you all the time. She'll listen to you. She'll give you a, an opinion or she'll give you advice. That's just the way she is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So she was back in his life and she was trying to help him. And over there, um, talking to see the grandkids, we'd take him to the park. He used to take me. The only thing I can remember him ever taking me or the place when I was when I was little, a baby, was Sefton Park. So I've always had this like deeply rooted like attachment and love for Sefton Park. So yeah. I took him to Sefton Park with the kids, and for a while we were like we were we were back in his life quite a lot, um, regular contact, speaking, bringing him to ours to see the kids, and then I think he just he's just in that mode where he doesn't want to help himself. So I found out I was sending, getting him meal, meal preps delivered, five, six meal preps, all like healthy food. And my brother was dropping the waters off. My mum was doing his washing. Um, but then he was feeding the meal preps to his dog. He was, like I'd text yeah. him sometimes, I'm going to get a reply and he'd say he couldn't really use his phone. And then I get a text at 11 o'clock in the night and he'd be ordering like a pizza. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I've just sent all meal preps to his house and trying to like basically help him and... Mm. I can but resonate I just, with that so much, mate, because yeah. my dad was, he suffered with addiction. He had mental health problems, but he he was an alcoholic and he was never there for us in, mm-hmm. in ways that he needed to be like a man, but he was always in our life, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I can relate to the, the you know, the self-help. He, he, he couldn't change. He, it was sort of like embedded in him. And I've looked a lot into like addictions and you probably heard of like Gabo Mate. Yeah. Stuff and, you know, it's it's not the addiction, it's it's why they're using it. So there's, there's more stuff beyond that with me dad that I never give him the time or day for yeah. to explain and all the psychiatrists that seen him probably never got to the root of why he was the way he was mm-hmm. you just like sort of dosed him up mate and I can relate to like losing your dad in that way you know what yeah. I mean it's, it's um, the same with dad he's obviously on methadone and mm-hmm. other um, other medication obviously for his for his for his legs and he's on all kinds yeah. to be honest he's just he's pumped with all kinds sometimes I try and have a conversation with me you can't even speak to him but yeah. he's still got that um, and again, it's not, it's not his fault, but he, you know, he, he's. He, I've given the choice to change. Yeah. I've given all the motivation, everything he needs. I'm like, here's your grandkids, mm. here's me. I no, you're really, really unhealthy. Just if if we're not enough motivation for you to start taking care of yourself, to live longer, and to make up for lost time, if that's not enough motivation, inspiration for you, then I can't help you. Yeah. I'll still be here for you if you need me. Mm. I've moved them into a house, literally two minutes away from where I live, so. If he does ever need me, I can. I'm there. And, yeah. But if I'm honest, I don't see him as much. If I go and see him, it's more of a good deed to him. Yeah. And to keep keep you know, we see him a couple of times a year because I tried and tried. I watch my mum try and try and watch my brother try. And he, he he's he's still in that real like like you said, real embedded in that victim yeah. Yeah. mentality, which yeah. will be down to past traumas and things which he's experienced growing up. I know his mum died when he was younger, mm. so you can say a lot of it's not his fault. But at the same time, I can't put too much time and energy into trying to pull him out of it. It's not your not job to save to, him. No, if he's not it? prepared to save himself, yeah. yeah. If he showed me a spark of, you know, basically interest in, or, uh, you know, want to actually be be better, yeah. I'd be right there and I'd be behind him and I'd back him all the way. But he's kind of got to either pull himself out of it or it's mm. just going to stay the way it is, really. Yeah. You know what I mean, I mean in, in this city, certainly, Mark, um, we have a lot of broken homes and, a lot of, you know, missing fathers. Sometimes we might have a father only. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, there's got to be a big shout out to the mums and certainly like my own mum in making sure we were raised the way we were yeah. in a turbulent environment. And it's the same to your mum. Yeah. Same. I don't know where the women get the scent from sometimes. Yeah, mate. but they've got it, haven't they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think they get put in that position where it's it's needs most, isn't it? And yeah. Um, yeah, they seem to pull it out the bag, mate, mm. don't they? Yeah. So... Obviously, you've, you've mentioned your dad then, mate, and we know how big for men, certainly, having that father role model is, as much as, like, we have the mum. We Men, we do need men around us. So was there anyone then, as you were growing up, who you looked to? Like, was the older men or anyone that you looked to, like, uh, to take on that little bit of a role yeah, for no, you? Yeah, I, I don't know. <clears throat> like, I, I was having an Uncle Paddy, and yeah. um, he's actually in prison at the minute. Um, But he was always, like... He was there for us in the sense, like his mother looked up to him, do you know what I mean? He was yeah. like one of the lads and he always had nice cars and all these nice material things. And he was like, he was kind of like the boy back in the day from 
where he was from, so I kind of looked up to them and like aspired to be, to be like him. But he, he weren't there all the time. He was just there and everywhere. Yeah. But I appreciated him when he came, and he always like he'd always give me a bit of money. And at the time, obviously, we didn't really have nothing. So if you come and go, yeah, there's a fiver. I'd be, yeah, I'd be made up, and yeah. he'd be, he'd mean the world to me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I love him to this day. He's one of them people again. It's very similar to me, mum. Like I could phone him anytime, anytime at all, anything needed, no questions asked. He, he, he'd be straight there, and you know, I, I love the bones of him. Do you know what I mean? I can't yeah. wait for him to come home, and I help him out in any way. Kind of get him bits of work, any bits of work, I get him. The first thing people do is ring me, go, he's hilarious, what a fucking boss fella he is. And he gets more work because of it, he's hard working, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But he made a few mistakes, mm. you know, maybe 10 years ago, I had a warrant out for years and years and was just living here, there and everywhere. And it caught up on him and for me, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to yeah. him, do you know what I mean? Sometimes it is, mate, isn't it? Stuff like that when, um, when mm. it comes along. But what was then, say... Through your childhood, mate, and like, you, you know, what was your school years like, Mark? Um, I'd look back now and I think I was a proper loner, to be honest with you. I, was, I remember I used to love climbing trees and I used to climb mm. trees and just sit in the trees and observe all my mates playing footy and I, I'd be up there for hours and all that might sound crazy to a lot of people, but I still see a big part of that in me now because I'm probably the most introvert, extrovert person mm. ever meet. I absolutely love spending time on my own. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like, I love spending time on my own. I love spending time just with my missus and kids. I don't like being in big groups or crowds of people. Yeah. I'm never, you, you'll virtually never see me out in town. I'm not a big drinker. I think maybe three, four times a year, I'll always be with my missus and a couple of close friends. Mm. But I'm not like, you know, might see me on the beach doing all these things. I'm on social media, but I'm only doing that because I know it helps people. And that's my motivation behind actually doing it. If I had the mm. choice, I wouldn't do it. But in, in a mad way, I feel like I haven't got any choice because I know that I'm, I've got the ability to be able to help people and I feel like I'm obligated to do it because yeah. of that reason. And it does give me a lot of fulfilment, but I'm not comfortable doing it. Do, do yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. You were unconsciously like becoming aware then, weren't you, when you were younger, mate? Like spending time alone. And... Yeah, I've spent loads of time on yeah. my own and you know, I was always just... Uh, I wasn't really a naughty kid. I didn't yeah. get up to no good. I was always fighting. I had this thing for like... <laughs> More than an obsession with fighting. I yeah. watched all the Rocky films. My mates were 15 drinking in parks. I had my mum in the back of my mind, fucking whatever your mates do, don't copy. Obviously reverting back to what my dad had done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's something my mum instilled into me um, for, for as long as I can remember. Don't follow people. Do do what you think is the right thing to do. And I've been in the environment, even to this day, preaching to my own kids and the kids who are coaching the schools. But, you know, these, these, these really, it's massive power in being able to be yourself yeah. and, and not not try and fit in with everyone else. Don't do what everyone else is doing. Exactly, yeah. Remember um, Sid told me that, mate, when I was like 16. Yeah. He said, ignore what everyone else is doing and go the opposite way and you'll do you'll be whatever you want to be called. Yeah, and a shout out to Sid because yeah. he's one of my best mates. Dad, yeah. and I've known yeah. Sid since I was about maybe 18, yeah. 19 years old. And I know other men as well as yourself who mm -hmm. he's had a massive impact massive. and influence over. And what a, what are the old school... Yeah, fucking nut job. Yeah, <laughs> legend. Yeah, Sid is, is, mate. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but he always told me that, mate. But you know, I didn't listen. Yeah. Anyway, at that age, and that was me downfall. I didn't listen. And you saw sure that as a teenage lad. Anyway, mate, you get sucked into the drinking, or I certainly did, mate. Anyway, obviously, I was fighting, but I got sucked into the drinking, and mm -hmm. then the, the, the drug culture, and you know, trying to impress everyone else. I really fell for that bait, mate. Um, and I didn't obviously wake up to that till I was about well, 24 you know what yeah. I mean but um, yeah it's, I think it's a it's, it's a big thing in this city mate the, the following people and you know the gang culture we've now got going on is really really big isn't it in this mm -hmm. city mate um, was you ever growing up affiliated to any type of gangs yourself mate or involved in any of them type of things not, or? not so much gangs but I got up to no good and definitely uh, from as long as I can remember I was looked up to like lads who had material things and mm. no way and really educated in school as I've said on on the last podcast it was just an earning a living basically and a, a, a means for me to get whatever I wanted because I, I was making a couple of hundred pound a week at one point selling sweets in school my mum was actually helping me believe it or not <laughs> maybe my mum had a proper craft in school and yeah. like that's all school was for me it weren't about education or anything else it was just a place I had to go and I had to be in there was certain lessons I really enjoyed science um, I liked woodwork, doing stuff with my hands. I hated maths, hated English. Um, but my main purpose when I was in school was actually 
my wife me to get all these things what I uh, what I wanted and obviously when I left school I didn't just leave school I lost a job yeah. do you know what I mean so it was like what do I do now and all these people who again as you say when you're young and you come from the areas what probably where from it's like mm. materialism and nice things and everything and that's how you basically measure someone's success and you know how how, uh, how great of a person they are based on what car they drive if they you know if they've got nice clothes nice watching that's obviously the things I wanted so I did go go down the wrong path for a while and you know I just that, that there was only way I seen of getting in it and then you know you talk about conditioning everyone's conditioned mm. everyone you speak about this and obviously you've got a good understanding of it mm. All your behaviours, your habits, your beliefs, your perceptions, they're all basically based on your environment, literally from before you're actually born. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, you get to 15 and you've grew up and all these people with nice things and you've only got them one way. It's like, really for you, that's, you don't see any, any other way. That's the reason why I'm in the schools now, working with kids, is because I know a lot of the people who they'll be looking up to now at their age are people who I looked up to when, when I was the same age and you don't know no different. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it is, literally, it is conditioning. That's all they say. It's hard to chase the dream, aren't we, of money yeah. and we're never happy, we're never satisfied with what we're, course, where we get. Of course, you've got no education and you come from a, you know, you've moved out fucking seven times growing up and lived in some of the, you know, the worst shitty places, so to say, mm. in Liverpool. Well, at, at what chance do you ever stand of actually getting these things? And so I went down the wrong road for a bit of when I definitely weren't no angel. But at the same time, it was kind of all, all as a new and, um, as I got a little bit older, then obviously I went into fighting and things started to change. You started to see things differently and, you know, take, take, take a different path. Do you think in school, and mate, we spoke about it before when we met up, it's like, do you think the way the system's set up, like we should be looking for kids' talents and trying to encourage their talents? So say you were a young kid, you know, you were aggressive, you were fighting. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you now bring that into the school environment, don't you? And you're yeah. someone the kids look up to. But should we not be looking in schools to sort of... I'm not here to put the education systems to right, by the way, mate, but we should be looking to like push these kids into things to good at. Because we get a lot of kids who yeah. are in school, certainly my lad's 14, and he's doing a lot of things that he doesn't want to do. And it's a lot of it's probably not of no value to him when he leaves. Yeah. But he should be pushed into stuff that he's actually good at or wants to do. You know, like this obviously you know they get their options and stuff like that. Do you think there's any way we could ever bring that in? I think they should definitely be leaning into more like creative things and like mm. in our culture, like Liverpool culture and society, so to say, it's if you can't play football or you can't box, you just end up on the aisle or doing whatever. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I think like, and if you look at the pain things like that, you know, a lot of it's football and really, they, they, like I'm, um, as you know, anyway, I'm in the schools, aren't yeah. I? And just before the lockdown was coming in, we were about to. Uh, launch it, it's called find your paper so basically what what my goal is is to get i do the ion project for six weeks so i'll take a group of kids and that's basically just martial arts saying i go in as a martial arts coach you don't know nothing about mindfulness not mm. about the mind anything which obviously I go in there to try and help them with they think i'm just coming in to teach them mma but like i pick them up on words can't so i'm like whoa hang on why can't you and like i'll mm. call the kids out on things and i'll explain to them things and so they, they do they take a lot a lot from and ask them loads of questions and and over the course of the six weeks the answers are obviously a lot more positive. I pick up on them changing the way they're speaking or catching themselves saying certain things. Mm. And that's basically what that six weeks is about to get them doing bits of meditation more from Martin. Uh, use the term mental fitness. So like I sell it to them, it's mental fitness. Um they do bits of yoga, but it's mobilization. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they basically do fitness sessions, mobilization. They do um, or yoga, sorry. They do meditation. They watch motivational, inspirational videos. Certain people who, are, who I've found and have inspired me and who are still watch this day, motivating me every morning. And um, I speak to the kids over routine, over habits, over basically, you know, what they're actually, you know, there is no limits. 15 years of age, there's no limits to what you can achieve. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I, I try and instill this into the kids and, be more of a role model what I know I, had, I, I could have done with when yeah. you know I was their age as opposed to thinking the only way you can I'm open with them I say I'm here I take a, I take a day off work whatever I do I don't get paid to do this it's voluntary I choose to do this because it makes me happy and because I know that if I was in your shoes the knowledge I've got at 36, 37 years of age it'd be massively beneficial for someone to come into a school and 
speak to me in that way and I'm teaching you to look after yourself to fight if you need mm. to but at the same time I'm trying to instill some of the discipline and the attitude that I learned through being in a martial arts gym and competing for 10 mm. years so it's like a, 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 an abundance of knowledge which I know is useful to these kids and the fact that I'm, I'm in a position myself financially in my own life to be able to go in and share that with these kids I'd do it five days a week if I was in a position to do so yeah at the minute obviously I'm still working and stuff I've got my own kids and commitments and I've got to wake and different businesses mm -hmm. and stuff but at the minute Thursdays are just dedicated to going in and motivating inspiring and, and helping the kids and I absolutely love it so it's yeah. like a win-win do you know what I mean it's something you certainly do mate um, my kids watch your videos they cringe at man do you yeah. watch yours he said you're, same for me. you're cool but I'm cringy you know what I mean yeah. you're cool and I'm cringy and that's what's <laughs> so it's, it's sad you know it's a win win mate my, my, my <laughs> missus has got her in full highlight reel of like she, I, she, I told her it's going this morning she's like oh god are you chatting again do you know what I mean <laughs> she was talking shite all morning again <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But, but a buzz off it and yeah. you know, I know she doesn't mean it. No, yeah. It's a bit of banter and whatever. Yeah, it's all good, my mate. Kids will, will, I know, I'm, 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 like that on my kids a little bit. I try mm. not to do it too much. Um, you know, if you, it's like, I'll use an example. My lad, boxers in Crocky, will not hit a pad if I, I've coached pretty much for 15, 17 years, 18 years. I've been coaching some sort of box for mm. a lot longer than that. I can hold a set of pads and I know what I'm doing. Mm. Well, my lad just won't won't engage in any type of like, just doesn't enjoy it, doesn't want mm. it. But like you could walk in or Carly walk into the house with a set of pads and go, you're all right, MJ, do you want to do some pads? And he'd be there yeah. all day. Yeah. They don't like, it's like they don't like the dad selling them. No. Like I can't coach my kids, mate. Never been yeah, there. Just, I, they just won't have it, will they? I just want whoever's going to get the best out of them. Yeah. Bringing the best out of them. So I'll take him wherever I've got to take him yeah. and I'll just let other people deal with it and I'll just be his dad. Yeah. I think that's all mm. they want, mate. They just yeah. want the dad. They don't want to, they don't want you to coach them, do they? And um, they take offence to pretty much everything you say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially can't. when they're There's 40, no, you mate. There's no such thing as constructive criticism. No. It's like, it's a telling off, isn't it? That's yeah. how they see it. Exactly. But I'm exactly. aware of that. And as I say, I don't, whoever brings the best out of them, that's where I want them to yeah, go. That's what, you're, that's what you want, mate, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, Mark. So where did the, you know, you've gone through your teen, teenage years a little bit. Um, and obviously then you said that you know you got up to a little bit of no good and this and that and then you mentioned about your fighting what age did that come into it that like the, the, the fighting side of things for you I started fighting when I was about 20 yeah which nowadays is late in mixed martial arts but when I started fighting it was like pretty much a brand new sport mm -hmm. it was still like caveman fucking straighteners in a cage <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. no amateur record straight in pro fights and like he just gloves just like it was just no like um governing bodies or no there was rules obviously he was based on the ufc rules mm. so there was rules in the fight but the way the shows are organized and all that if you compare them to now it's like it's night and day it's like now it's proper organized fucking sports gonna virtually be see being in the olympics in in the next couple of years mm. um and it's one of the fastest well it's the fastest growing sport in the world you know what i mean mm. You know, you've got the likes of Dana White, the UFC, all these, even like local organisations now, if you look at the way they ran compared to when I first started competing, it was like, there's just, there's, excuse me, there's no no comparison whatsoever. Yeah. It's big, isn't it, no? Like, yeah. I, I never used to watch it, ever. Yeah. Obviously, I was just boxing, 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 mate, mm -hmm. but I've like, obviously, because of Darren Till, I think, yeah. um, he swung a lot of people in it, in, more people into it, from this yeah, city, he has, hasn't yeah. he? Mm, he's, um, he's got a big following, mate, so... You started your, your, your fighting, mate. Where did it go from there? That, that when you realised you were like, I'm actually quite good at this. Or, you know, what, what yeah, was your journey into that fighting. from there? I was, even at that point, when you were speaking about being younger, I didn't mm. really have a big phase of like going out and going to town. But I did go to town now and again. To be honest, most of the time we'd end up getting into conflicts or fights or arguments. Mm. And um, one time I was driving out town, and there's a lad, actually, a friend of mine, I haven't seen him for years and years, but if he does ever get to watch this, he knows who he is, so I'll just like to say hello and I hope you well. Um but yeah, we had some mutual friends and I I, I kind of drove into that being for a Chinese. Um, I was just driving out of town as you do when you're 19, yeah. 20 with your mates, about 19, yeah. And um she's an argument between a group of lads who are know who are mates from by like my area, and a lad who I know who we had some mutual friends and he was badly outnumbered. So but as you do, I've pulled in and been like, look, I know these and these like, look, we don't want to do him in, but he's, you know, he's 
I don't know how far does he want to push? He's giving us loads, Mark. Mm. We're gonna we're gonna hurt him, and so I've end up getting in the middle and trying to help him. And the next minute, I've end up fighting with him because he's turned on me. <laughs> so there was a load of bravado anyway over the course of a week. And bearing in mind at this time, I'm like scan off, like you know, we used to take pride in me, like the cock of the year, and mm. wanted everyone to know what could fight with whatever that relates to from when I was younger. Mm. I still haven't figured that out, but yeah. I wanted everyone to know I could fight and I did have a bit of a reputation, obviously, for being able to look after myself. And we had a, we had a bit of a scuffle in town, which resulted in a real fight a week later, like an organised, very straight and assault to say, mm. on a car park, as you'd imagine, like off shooters <laughs> or something like that. Um, it was all fair, because as I say, we had mutual friends and he wanted to fight me just as much as I wanted to fight mm. him. And, so we had a fight a week later and it was just absolutely like an embarrassing. So I've taught like him obviously King Kong and I think he's obviously taught he's the same. Mm. And within three minutes we were both knackered rolling around on the floor, headlocks, giving each other nuggies and <laughs> it was fucking embarrassing and that's, yeah. that's just how it is. Do you know what I mean? Mm. The first time since I've been a kid, I'd actually had an organised fight where I'd met someone and we'd gone toe to toe and mm. you know, I, I just realised I weren't nowhere near as fit. Like I weren't fit, I just done weights and maybe a couple of rounds of boxing pads once once a week that was my cardio but I was on that get massive one body part a day mm. eat loads of KFC and was in that little um, phase of my life the thing know, I had a lot of people full skinhead yeah do you know what I mean thought it, was the absolute, yeah, thought it was the absolute dog's bollocks as this fight and like to be honest I won't even say who won and who lost um, but I learned a lot about myself yeah. in the uh, in the fight and literally it was an it was an absolute game changer for mm. me because I went straight off and never lifted the weight and probably six months after I mean actually had a resentment over weight because we're like blaming weight and blaming my diet and for, mm. like for, for, for basically me performance in, in this fight what a, this is the shock and life and account to myself I'd given yeah. Yeah. and he, he's, if he's what he was no worse he was no better than me <laughs> the both of us thought yeah. we big hard cases yeah. and in all honesty you know we weren't yeah. compared to a trained fighter or someone with a good level of fitness, you know, to box or, hmm. you know, it was all like but this image I created of myself, massive ego and all the rest of it. And so I actually started speaking and looking into like where I could go to learn to fight. I started, I love Mo Vama. I was up Mo Vama, a good mate of mine, Gareth O'Neill. Um, at the time, he, he, he was into like mountain walking and running loads of fitness and he was a massive lad as well, hmm. but, but really fit and, I started knocking about with him and he was good mates with Paul Cahoon. Mm. Um, and to this day, I'm very grateful for ever meeting because he basically took me under his wing and took me up to Allerton Submission, which was the first gym I ever fought out of and just started spending time with me, teaching me fighting. And, you know, again, going up and training with the lads up there, I realised, like, you just, you know, I was getting twisted up and thrown around like a ragdoll by lads who were 10 stone. I was probably like 14 and a half stone at the time. It started with the grappling then. That's started with started, the grappling, yeah. yeah. I'd always done bits of boxing, stuff like yeah. that, but I just went up with Paul and he introduced me to wrestling and grappling, but I instantly absolutely loved it. Loved it. I'd, I'd go up there, I'd get battered and I'd drive mm -hmm. home like dead happy and just feel like this is what this is what I'm supposed to be doing, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's a humbling to it, mate, isn't it? When you go to like these gyms, even like a boxing gym or like an MMA <clears> gym, <throat> yeah. you're very quickly humbled, aren't you? Yeah. If the ego's knocked out of you, you might get the big lad coming in who thinks he's hard, but mm. within, a, within a session, mate, or two, that's knocked out of him because he's getting in with a lad who's 10 stone, he's getting choked yeah. out. Even old people, you get out there, there was old, old men in there who trained for years and years and mm. he was just absolutely playing with me and I was like physically so much bigger and stronger than them. Mm. But I weren't wrestling fit and I didn't have no technique. But I had a lot of resilience, that's something that like, I did have. Mm. People would be choking me and I'd be in chokes like, no, not not tapping. <laughs> they switching to the different submission because I just like yeah. refused to yeah. tap the amount of injuries and that what I got just through like basically through ego and mm. not not wanting to like admit that they got the better of me and but at the same time I think it can be a quality as well. Do, mm. do you know what I mean? Because you know again obviously come from childhood and the same as most like most core beliefs and you know parts of our personality. But mm. it served me well. Um, not in, case, in terms of like how many injuries I pick up and you know, basically getting in chokes and my teeth mm. would be crushed and I was yeah. like, it's half like a lunatic, but I, I gained a lot of respect in the gym and I did have that never like kind of quit mentality when it was competing and and I, I, as I say, I, I absolutely loved it. I trained for a week and um, 
in Adenton or two. And then a couple of times Paul had taught me some really, really like basic techniques mm. and stuff like that. And then he, he'd had a trip plan to Brazil, so I jumped on a trip to Brazil with him. Met a few guys over there who I become friends with. So you gone um, straight from that gym doing the grappling, and yeah, then you, you ended up in Brazil from that. I just jumped on a on yeah. a trip with Paul and Gareth came, and there's a couple of us, and wow. we, just, we just bent on it with Paul. Went to Brazil, spent a week over there. I, I trained a couple of times, but the lads over there were just on a level where I didn't see myself. No, but I, I just got battered, like mm. battered a couple of times. I rolled. I'd gone there for like Aldi, basically. So I was brand new to fighting, and I just jumped in a couple of training sessions, but. I met a few friends over there, came home, probably been home for a week, two weeks tops, and was straight on a plane on my own back over there and mm. spent 10 weeks over there. Um, and it was just like a crash course in fighting, grappling, uh, humility. <laughs> <laughs> just like, I, I took so much from that mm. first 10 weeks I spent. I think it was, yeah, it was about 10 weeks. I took so much for that, it, it, like... It changed me as a, as a person. Mm. Okay, I went there bigger, obviously, with a skinhead that came on with a cauliflower ears, just like a whole different person. Obviously, a, a much, it was probably the equivalent of training for 12 months mm. back, back at home, no. grappling-wise and MMA-wise, because I just jumped straight in the deep end. I was in the shark tank and <laughs> just absolutely got battered yeah. every day. Um, but I loved it. I think... Listening to that experience, Mark, it's like when when we're younger, when we're young boys, we, we, we sort of, you probably know about this already, mate, but we we, we, we want to be initiated. And and that's sort of an initiating experience, isn't it? Going mm. away, you're away from home. You're away from everyone. You're going to spend 10 weeks in Brazil and you're getting your ass kicked, mate. You're getting thrown into the lines then. It's probably a little bit scary at times, some of the men about you getting in with, mate. Yeah, but it, it wasn't at the time. Like, it... It wasn't scary. Yeah, you felt, you know I mean? you felt at home there. in there. I, I didn't even think, Paul. It was just mm -hmm. like, just going with the flow and wherever it was and whatever it loved. And when you went out. I just went with it. I didn't yeah. actually consciously think about what I was doing. I exactly, was just yeah. doing it naturally with yeah. no thought whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a sense, I look back now and I'm grateful for the fact that I was seeking these uncomfortable situations yeah. and Could we do seek them, mate, as men, you know what I mean? I was doing it sub like subconsciously, not even realising yeah. Yeah. that I was doing it. And at the same time, I think in the time I was there, the first couple of weeks, I'd just get beat up. It was just fresh meat. Didn't know me, didn't know me nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know them nothing. They just batter me, but they started putting time into me after a while. So obviously I'd take that as a sign of a, of a the respect to some extent because I didn't miss, it, miss a session. I showed up. I took an eye in every class. Um, and after a while, I started to get close to some of them and say, virtually none of them spoke the same language. There was one or two lads in the gym who spoke English. They don't be translate and stuff like that, but I was just going there a stranger from fucking Liverpool mm. in both a Fogo team and all lads out of the favelas. Because mm. I, I studied Luta Livre, which is like the poor the poor man's version of Jiu Jitsu, what it was back in the day. Um, so the lads I was with were like you'd imagine and um, compare them to like scousers, like the lads, do you know what I mean? Not like posh or looked after mm. all. I had money, these like <coughs> gangbangers out of the favelas mm. who come there to train and they beat each other up. And, but there was a proper brotherhood in the family and they, they, mm. I was like the adopted scout, so they got pictures of me on the wall in the gym even to this day. Mm. Um, and like they took me in, they, they helped me. Like they went from wanting to kill me to like wanting to coach me and they put time at him. And I remember feeling genuine, like when I look back now, I felt genuine love mm. for the lads in there because they didn't have to do nothing for me. They weren't getting nothing out of me. They were just helping me because I was there. Do you know what I mean? They didn't have to. Mm. And, and I think that played a big part in obviously me going down the coaching road myself and mm. wanting to share that because I've been on on the end of the receiving end and knowing how it feels to be helped. And, you know, and I've always, like, even to this day now, like I coach them in main. I've always coached now. I've enjoyed coaching. I love seeing people develop, people improve. And, but I've kind of come away from the martial arts in terms of competing and training in Cowboy all the time. Um, but it's still a big part of my life in terms of I use my Instagram to share information and knowledge mm -hmm. which I think will help people. I'm in the schools working with the kids and that's because I know I've got knowledge and information and, and it's my motivation behind studying and improving myself. So I get a lot back from it myself as well. But I've just realised that's a part of who I am. Who I am and a lot of it was um, kind of built in the time what I'd spent initially and 
And the other times, obviously, you went back, I spent over like the course of six, seven years. I, I go there two, three times a year or any mm. time. I could afford to, and at the time, I'd be over there mm. training and developing myself. But the love what I got from the people over there was like next level. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lesson in that, mate, isn't it? Spending yeah. time over there, like a life lesson for you. Yeah. Um, to share I've with everyone. A lot everyone. of growth and a lot of time on my own, too, because I'd yeah. stay in an apartment on my own a lot of the time. And I'd just go to the gym, train with the lads. And when I weren't training with the lads through the week, especially, I'd just be running or walking on the beach or just reflecting on my life and it I, I spent a lot of time then obviously at that point I think I started to become a bit more conscious over who I am mm. and what I wanted and looking at my past and things like that but not on a deep level but I definitely and spending all that time on your own you've got to you obviously got to look inside have you? a good look mate and I think we yeah. overcomplicate life mm. we look for all these things external mate but you know like you say going to the gym yeah. going for the run Spending time alone. Well, there's no iPhones. Exactly. There's no social media. I think MySpace at the time, but I never really went on. I went to an mm -hmm. internet cafe to speak to my missus a couple of times a week. Um, other than that, I was just literally just living a fighting life. Mm -hmm. And if I went in the gym, I was just on my own, relaxing, sleeping, eating, walking down the beach, just just spending time on my own. So mm -hmm. massive amount of growth in it. Yeah. Um, that I'm very, very, very uh, grateful and appreciative mm -hmm. for. Oh, okay. massive blessing like mm. obviously I never reached my potential in fighting nowhere near which is mm. something else you can speak about if you want to but yeah absolutely mate I think oh. let's get so you've done your Brazil stuff you know and then leaning into what after that mm. and then we'll talk about where then if you can just let everyone know me where, where you got to then with your um, with your fight career and obviously if you didn't reach your potential and, and what the downfalls were yeah um, I think so I was in car one, I'd spent a lot, a lot of time in Brazil. So the problem what I had was my level was always very, very high in terms of like t technique and even like physically I was, I was a fit, strong lad and I was very dedicated at right. I'd done, I ticked every box event and I overtrained a lot, which which again was maybe a downfall and something mm. more, you know, I could help people with because um, I made a lot of mistakes, like a hell of a lot of mistakes. But I think the, the biggest mistakes what I made are all mental. Um, obviously with the knowledge what I've got now and stuff I've studied since coming away from fighting mm. I've looked back on my fighting career and see exactly where I went wrong um, so as I say I was a good level fighter like a really high level fighter in the UK but I was still fighting on domestic shows with, with a very limited experience so I've got four or five fights under my belt professional fights mm. and they're all wins but I'm struggling to get opponents because like the UK is only a small place and we were in a massive amount of gyms and we had lads come up to our gym from some different gyms and so people would come to the gym and I'd, I'd like basically do whatever I, I wanted because I was on training with Brazilians in Brazil and mm. compared to like just domestic lads who didn't really, some of them didn't even have like grappling coaches or they were just, MMA was like really new at the time. Yeah, it was raw. Yeah, so everyone kind of knew <coughs> the ability what I had. But I just didn't have the experience. I'd never had no amateur fights or nothing like that. I'd just gone straight into pro fights, literally a couple of weeks of coming back from the first time I'd been in Brazil. So I had my first pro fight maybe on like three, four months uh, training. Like, so I was, I was a beginner mm. when I had my first professional fight. And I'd had no prior fighting experience apart from a few scraps when I was a kid and that's right. When I was about 19. <laughs> that was embarrassing, do yeah. you know what I mean? So... Um, I think everyone, I knew how good I was because we were obviously training mm -hmm. with really high level lads. I was even a little bit later on going to the likes of the States and I was training with, paired up with like Vitor Belfort, like top 10 ranked fighters. And I was going into gyms and getting pulled away from whatever group I was in. And they put me going, oh, hang on, we need you. You go over there, you go with Vitor Belfort, Martin Campman. And I was competing and I was on the same level mm -hmm. as, as them lads. But then when I came home, I always felt like I didn't have the same confidence and I, I didn't feel like I was coaching a lot so they said go away to gain information and knowledge in terms of martial arts and I'd come home and be purpose would be to share that with everyone else because mm. um, me and Terry Etam at the time as well as Colin Adam we were doing most of the coaching I had a Brazilian uh, my brother Brigadier he, he was spent a, a, like a long while in Liverpool and he, he was like the Luta Livre coach but he went, he went and I was at a point where I felt like I was like a, a big fish in a small mm. a small pond, so to say. We had loads of trainer partners, all amazing fighters, all different qualities and good at different things. But I did spend a lot of the time coaching and helping other people. And I always felt like 
your confidence would drop because I weren't getting that dopamine kick what you mm. need from like tapping someone who's better than you or you know Colin saying there's like absolutely brutal at saying what we used to do like <laughs> on, a, on a totally another level oh, yeah. do you know what I mean um, physically get you in great shape Colin's an absolutely amazing coach yeah at the time he was more of a striking coach not an MMA coach because obviously his background's in Muay Thai I coached a lot of the MMA and kind of helped people integrate the different martial arts mm -hmm. you know, mix the wrestling and the boxing and the grappling and, but I always felt like I weren't putting enough into myself I was maybe sharing a bit not, I won't say sharing too much but I weren't in a position where I was growing and learning me and Terry at Spa and in a five minute spa he'd be like I'd know what he was going to do and he'd know what I was going to do because mm -hmm. we coached each other we helped each you other you know each other that well don't you yeah I mean kind of like the, you know up there like the top like level wise you know, we were very similar, I'd say, ability-wise. Mm. Teddy's one of the most talented fighters you'll ever meet. He's more talented than me. Um, but I think at the time I was going away and training with different people. And, but we were really, like, close. And we knew, like, what I knew what he was going to do before he'd mm. do it. And he'd know what I was going to do. So, in that sense, it was like, I did never, I felt like I did, like, a wall. And the only time I'd improved, really, was when I was able to, to go away do you know what I mean I'd come home I'd maybe lack a bit of confidence and um, then it comes to getting matched up for fights and like no no, there's no ego when I say this there wasn't many people who want to fight me and you can understand why so you've got a lad who's like 12 and 1 or mm. 10 and 0 why is he going to take a fight with someone who he knows is coaching lads in Carbon and spends like half the year mm. in Brazil and mm. like the place is on a really high level it's not going to help him progress and get towards he wants to mm. you know wherever he wants to go so it was hard getting me fighting. A lot of the time I'd fight people who really shouldn't be fighting. They were nowhere near my level, but they were the only people who would take the fights. And yeah. So that added even more pressure then because obviously I had a, I, it wasn't a case of I had to go in and win a fight. It was in, in my in my, uh, in my own views, it was like I had to go in and, and fight an absolutely perfect fight and everyone expected me to have a perfect fight because yeah. everyone kind of knew how good I was and the potential what I had but I lacked the experience and I didn't understand my mind. So I come to the point where I didn't understand or I couldn't like manage my thoughts. I couldn't manage the anxiety. It overwhelmed me and it'd take over and like it affected me in terms of in the gym. I was amazing. <coughs> but when it comes to fighting and competing, I didn't want to be in the Before fight. Before you got in sort of thing, would you, yeah. would you be getting like this horrible anxiety leading into getting Every into fight, the, like, I the warm up? Every fight, I the warm ups and like the mm. pre pre preparing for the fight. Even like the last week, I was always trying to learn out and trying to figure out my mind. How should I be behaving? What should I be thinking? I, you know, I, I didn't know. and I, no, no one had ever told me at the time. You've got to take into account sports and performance mind coaches when I was competing. They were seen as a weakness because mm. it was physical. Fighting was physical. Didn't just every top athlete now has got a mental, like a mind coach, a sports and performance mind coach. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Back then, if you had one of them, it was, it was like, people were like, what's he got one of them for? He's weak. Mm. And it was embarrassing. Obviously, I, did, I cared what people thought. And, I, you know, them things weren't even accessible. They weren't like it is now. People didn't understand the power of your mind and mm. how important it is um, in sports or anything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I didn't have no one like that to help me. I was just trying to figure all these things out myself on unlimited on, on experience. And at the same time, putting all this other pressure on most of the fights I was going into, I, I might have a, a decent opponent, but I guarantee a week before the fight, he'd pull out. Mm. So I'd end up fighting some tough taffies, got a, a, more losses on his record than wins. And that had even more pressure, which I didn't like. I, wa I wanted these like better opponents to try and test myself and improve, but mm. I'd always end up fighting people who I was supposed to just wipe out in the first minute. And if you imagine you, you, everyone expects you to wipe someone out in the first minute, you know how good you are and what you're capable of. It's like, I'd be three minutes into a fight and I'd be thinking in my head, shit, he's not supposed to be here. I'm yeah. fucking, he shouldn't even be. And you're not relaxed on? then? When you're not relaxed no. and you're forcing things then, aren't you? You're, yeah. not, you're not being you. No, and you, like you, we, we understand flow states and things mm -hmm. like that now. The, the greatest fight, fighters, football players, whoever, they, they enter a the flow state, which means they're actually doing it automatically. They don't have to think about it because they love what they're doing. Mm -hmm. When, when, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you practice something so much and absolutely love being in that, that's a state of freedom, it's even a state of meditation to yeah. some extent. And Completely I, present in what you're doing. Yeah, aren't you, mate? I was the opposite. I yeah. was like thinking about what I'm going to do next and thinking about the people outside being a fight, thinking about like the people outside the cage and what are these going to think? Why am I in this position? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't even be a. What if I get beat? 
Sorry, yeah, I always used to think, yeah, what if I get beat? What if I get knocked out in front of everyone? But my biggest fear weren't actually the losing. It was not yeah. fighting perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. absolute perfection. It's me preparation okay. in every single aspect of fighting. I'd train two hours in the morning. I'd sleep on the mats in the gym or in a little dormitory. And I'd, I'd sleep, I'd watch fighting, I'd eat. I'd train again in the afternoon. The only, I had then one of the only fighters who was training three times a day, some days. I'd put strength and conditioning in and then I'd do the two hours in the evening. Mm-hmm. So... I was completely living and breathing it. It meant everything to me and I absolutely loved it. But I couldn't handle the pressure what that brought when it come to fighting because, which made me then not actually enjoy being in a fight. Mm. So I didn't enjoy the nerves and all the anxieties because I didn't know, understand them or didn't know how to control them. And then I didn't actually enjoy being in the fight because all that other pressure was going on consciously while I was actually in a fight. If, if you know what I mean, I know exactly you? what you mean, mate. You're, you're, you're expected to be perfect, or you're putting that pressure yeah. on yourself that everyone expects you to be punch perfect. Yeah, and that's not realistic, is it, mate? To be honest, when you when you're in the fight game, it's whatever happens happens. Mm-hmm. When you're in there, you just start, like you say, you've got to be in flow. But but I was like six, seven fights into a professional <coughs> career. Um, I'd won with like a quick ten second knockout in the Olympia. Was the last fight that I was on this high, and then. Um, the UFC called, somebody had someone pull out like three weeks after. So at the time, my missus was in slow labour, I think, when I fought. So she was ready to, ready to drop with me son, who was 10. And you were fighting? I'd worked towards this UFC contract yeah, for like yeah. forever, basically. That was like yeah. me, me goal and everything else. But as my missus was pregnant with me lad, and obviously but at the mm. time I was struggling a bit for money and whatever money I had, mm. I was trying to invest in myself to go away. The UFC money then was not nowhere near what it is now still not great now obviously mm. with your first few fights but it was buttons then compared to what you get now so I was in a position where the UFC had called um, and I got this thing what I worked towards basically for the last seven years whatever it was but then my missus was about to have a kid and shit gets real doesn't it the minute you have kids like mm. you're not about you or even your missus it's about like you've got someone to look after and yeah. I had a fight in the UFC mm. again went into the fight uh, not expecting myself to win, going there to have an exciting fight. That was my goal. If I can, I remember at the time, it was no like I'm going here to win. Like I'm like it was never that. I mean, mm-hmm. like because it was the UFC it was a big stage. It was short notice. I didn't know how to handle nerves and everything else. But, but it was a big opportunity. But it was what what, what I worked towards. Mm. I went into that with the attitude and then have an exciting fight. I'm gonna put a show on. All the rest of it, we won fight of the night, so we got like a seventy thousand dollar bonus. Mm. Um, but I lost the decision, and I know I lost the decision because I made bad decisions in the fight because I was in like straight in the mode. It weren't like a technical fight. I just went in there like all guns blazing to mm. have an exciting fight and made really like decisions I'd never make in a million years in the gym during the fight, and they and it was a close fight. You know, um, I was in Germany against the German. Mm. You always go there, don't you? Everyone's saying to me before, look, you've got to beat them, you've got to knock them out. You've got to more than beat them out. can't go the distance, yeah. yeah. Um, so I've gone in there basically to knock them out or guillotine them. They were me to go to's at the time. Yeah. And it didn't happen. I was looking for it in the fight instead of just being in a flow state and letting it happen. I was like searching for the knockout, searching for the guillotine the whole time. And I lost the decision. Um, came away and, you no, know, that was just like, in a, in a bit of a bad place to be honest and very disappointed in myself knew I threw the opportunity away understood mm. what I'd done wrong my mentality and everything going into the fight and, and and pretty much made a decision then I don't know whether this is for me my missus had, the, had me little lad and he wasn't well when he was born as he um, called us wrapped round his neck five, six times and there's a few complications he had to stay in after he was born for a bit and I think I um, that threw me off a little bit for a while. And I think then um, about, about six months had gone on and the UFC offered me another fight. They actually gave me a contact. They were impressed with the fight and everything else. But financially, I was in a fucking shit position. Um, I'd had a son who basically was me world and me obsession. And I just, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was a bit all over the place, to be honest, for a good 12 months. I didn't want to go back to a fight because I understand and know that if you're competing and you're fighting, the same as anything in life, You've got to go all in. Mm. And I didn't feel it mentally or financially in a position to be able to go all in. And I ended up giving it like a year, two years, where I was, again, I just didn't know. My goals then and my priorities was basically to start earning money. 
Um, so as I say, I had a son to look after and I was coaching and things like that at the time. People think like the fighting no mark, the fighting game, not there's money in it. Yeah. Like, you know, <clears throat> I've seen Carly, mate, for instance, you know, the selling tickets and like all the boxers, and I'm sure it's the same with the MMA, mate. They, they think they're on all top dollar because mm. they've on telly and it's it's not the case. These boxers are going around selling tickets. That's how they make the money, isn't it? Yeah. They're, um, there's not as much money in it as you think. So they're having to, you know, I think we lose a lot of probably talented fighters, mate, because of that. Yeah, it, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. You, <clears throat> you've, got to, you've got to be prepared to make sacrifices. Yeah. But that just wasn't, I, even now, the understanding I've got of myself, that just wasn't me. I weren't prepared to sacrifice, giving my son time and hmm. basically the, the, the stuff he needed, giving me, me, me wife a, a good life. Because they'd have had to go through a shitty period of us having nothing, basically. And, you know, with the UFC at the time, you contacted the three fights, you're on $6,000 to fight, 6000 if you win. I didn't have the belief in myself, and mm -hmm. that's all it boils down to, to take enough of a gamble. So do you believe you could have, if you had stuck about into the fight? It's probably not a person who ever trained or been in the gym who doesn't believe that I could have gone all the way and made a great career mm -hmm. as a fighter. I failed in fighting. Do you, do you believe it, though? Do you believe you could have now? I know, I had the ability because yeah. I was fucking getting pulled out of groups of people who I was wearing in Vegas mm. to train with the, the best fighters in the world who went on to win world mm. titles and absolute legends, mm. Hall of Famers. And like they were tapping me, but I was tapping them and we were sparring. Mm. And it was 50-50 training. Mm. We were all on that level. I was on that level. Um, as I say, I lived and breathed fighting. I studied mm. it. I loved it. If we weren't training, I was watching it. I watched telly nothing. I just always watched fighting, instructional techniques. Like, like I, I, I completely like committed to being a mixed martial artist and mm -hmm. to, up until the point of having my son, that was all I was ever going to do. That was like my goal in life was just to be paid and earn a living or fighting. It, it wasn't even to the point where I wanted to be or or I actually said, I'm going to be the best welterweight in the world, which in my opinion, if, you, if you're a fighter, now that, that it should be like, you no, know, my goal, I'm going to be the best the number one welterweight mm -hmm. on the planet. That's my goal, that's my focus and that's what I'm working towards. Mine weren't. Mine was just to be in a living and be comfortable financially of doing something what I loved, mm. which for me, now looking back, is, is not the right mentality or mindset to that. But as I say, I didn't understand my mentality mm. or my mindset. I had a lot of limiting beliefs and I struggled with confidence at the time, you know, myself. Um, but it wasn't meant to be. As I say, I'm happy and comfortable to sit here and say, in fighting, I failed just for the simple fact I didn't reach my potential. Mm. But at the same time, I don't focus on that. There's absolutely nothing I'll ever fail in again because of that. I know it feels to fail and I'll embrace that feeling and I'll use it to motivate me to make sure that whatever I do, I go all in, I commit and I believe 100% that I'll achieve whatever whatever I want. Mm. And again, that's something I'm grateful for my experiences in fighting. For there's so many things I can take from fighting <coughs> in terms of friendships, what I learned, you know, the humbling experience, the places I've been, the list's endless. It's like a brotherhood, isn't it, mate? There's absolutely not one ounce mm. of negativity in any way. I see no. people around you go, Fuck, you could still fight now. Yeah. They might see me and Pads and Jim and go, Lad, why don't you go and have a fight now? And I'm like, listen, Pads and, and fighting martial arts at a professional level yeah. is like a totally different ball game. Mm. People don't understand how much time and energy you've got to put into it and you've got to commit to fighting. There's nothing else for me. You can't work and and be a, a top level mixed martial artist. It's, you know, there's probably people out there who do it, but not for me, because whatever I am involved in or whatever I want to do, I'm, I'm, I'm all in or I'm, I'm all out. Mm. There's no, there's no in the middle, do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm happy to sit here and say, I didn't nowhere near, nowhere near reach my potential in fighting, because it was very, very good technically. Mm. And I know a lot. Um, it was the mental aspect. And the mental side of fighting, which totally let me down. And what resulted in me not reaching my potential, as I say, I didn't understand the mind. I was trying to figure it all out. I had virtually no fight experience before competing in MMA. I only had 11 fights in total up until the UFC fight. I'd had seven. That was, I think that was my seventh or my eighth. Mm. My eighth fight. So I had very, very, most of my fights are finished in the first round or within a couple of minutes. So I had really limited experience and, that along with me not understanding my mind, trying to learn how I should be thinking, what I sh how I should be reacting or responding to all these nerves and the different, you know, emotions and feelings and the warm ups. And it was like I was still learning, mm. even up until my last fight. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so would you say that was the turning point then? Would you have having your, your first child? 
Is that a big turning point in your life, do you think? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Because obviously the experience I had growing up, there was no man in my <coughs> life and there's, there's one thing I, I'll never, uh, I'll always be there for my son, do you know what I mean? Mm. So. I think sometimes, well, certainly in my experience, um, my childhood mate, as, and my relationship with my dad has made me such a, like, sometimes a little bit attached to me kids to, mm. to and sometimes we're pushing them you know what I mean really pushing them to be the best they can be and sometimes it can affect the family dynamic you know what I mean yeah. but with, like, with, like, I'm like yourself you know we've got the kids out nearly every single night they're doing the footy they're doing the boxing they're doing the MMA they're mm. doing the yoga um, you know so do you, th- do you think like the way you were raised do you think that's going to help you as a dad yeah, because there's two ways you can look at it. You can have a really, really bad dad <coughs> and you can follow in the footsteps or you can learn from all his mistakes. Mm. And that's the greatest thing he's given me. He's taught me how to be a dad through him being the wrong mm. type of dad. So I've learned so much from him. I'm grateful to my dad. I love my dad. I don't see him. I don't spend a lot of time with him. He's still my dad. I've absolutely got no negative feelings, emotions, resentment, absolutely nothing towards me. I'm absolutely grateful for everything. The greatest thing he could have ever done was leave me alone for 18 years and leave me mum alone for 18 years. Mm. And I think subconsciously, in, in some ways, he's known that himself and that's why he's took himself away from us because he was doing more damage than good. Mm. So, you know, it, it's a very generous that's thing a what, he's, to look at it, mate. what he's given to us because, you know, he probably wanted to be around us and wanted to spend time around us. Maybe, you know, I know he's got absolutely no self-worth. Mm. Thinks absolutely nothing of himself. If he comes to me, I was having to tell him to sit up and when he speaks to us, he's like looking at the floor and... Mm. You know, as I say, I've tried to help him and we have tried to help him, but he doesn't want to help himself. Yeah. And I've got my own kids, all my energy and my time goes into my own kids, my wife, my own work, my own, the people who I'm really close to, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's not, I haven't got the time to put into him if he's not prepared to, you know, try and make the changes himself. Yeah, the door's open if he ever wants to. The door's open, I love him, he's my dad. Mm. You know, show me any, any sign of, want to become a better person, want to live a little bit longer, be a little bit healthier. You know, kids don't get a text on the birthdays or Christmas, mm. I don't, you know. Mm. Father's Day, I'll get a text. Like, where's my baby saying, where's my, why haven't you been out to see me? <laughs> I don't hear often the kids, don't even know the kids' birthdays, yeah. do you know what I mean? Mm. But I'm not a, that's who he is, I accept him, I love him. And that's just the way it is, do you know what I mean? I think it's a lovely way, the way you're looking at it, mate. Like, that it's your greatest teacher and also that you fail you. It's your greatest teacher. You yeah. know, something that you fail at, you know, if you keep trying or or, or it, it's led you on to where you are now, hasn't it? That you'll never fail again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that's a boss way to look at it. I understand least. failure as a mentality because I've experienced it myself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Failure is a, it's a mindset. I think that's why you're so relatable, Omar, you know, because you've, you, you've, you're just a normal lad doing doing boss things, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you, you've changed your mindset and you've definitely had a big impact on 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 the people of this city base, you know what I mean? Certainly like my kids and stuff like that as well. You know, Thomas has come to Calvin a couple of times. Yeah, I love Thomas. Thomas is a great legend. Both the kids are yeah. amazing kids, aren't they? Yeah. Thomas has spent more time around Thomas, but mm. he's an absolute credit to you because you see him doing things now, do you know what I mean? What, like, how valuable is that for mm. like, you know, in, at his age to be learning them things and to having them things ingrained and instilled mm. in him. Like, you know, he... he He's, uh, he's very driven, isn't he? And yeah. he's determined. And But he's still got that funny side. And like, the playfulness he, he's a great kid, honestly. Yeah. He's yeah. an absolute uh, pleasure to coach and mm. to be around. <laughs> I've been on the beach, talking mate. mate. Ah, <laughs> RMJ's the same, mate. He does not, honest to God, he does not stop. <laughs> million questions a day, but bring it on, ask the you know, yeah. questions, how you get, get answers, That's isn't it? That's it, mate. Yeah. So we can ask as many mad questions as he likes, <laughs> yeah. do you know what I mean? Pots. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's brilliant, mate. Um, so after you're fighting them, Mark, you've had, you've had your first child, mate. Yeah. What's brought you to where you are now? Um, well, I, around the time I, I could <coughs> fight, I actually went back and had a couple of fights in Brazil about two years after I had, had the UFC fight and I had yeah. sem, semi-retired or whatever. I was still in the gym every day training with the lads, but I was working as well. So I weren't like as committed where I was training three times a day, but I was in the mornings, I was coaching in the evenings and still heavily involved in car one and being around the lads, but... I was in a position where obviously I had to get off my ass and go and earn some fucking legitimate money and mm. um, end up buying into a security company with me UFC bonus money probably at the time. Um, a good mate of mine who actually coached, he's my best mate at this day and uh, my business partner and again, someone I'm very, very uh, 
grateful to have in my life. He's a brother and we think a lot of the same way and mm. very similar in a lot of ways. And um, he's helped me massively get to the position I'm in uh, to become who I am today. Just having a partner and someone who spent so much time at over, over the last probably 12, 13 years. Mm. Um, so he, he, he was working with someone. Um, had some bars and door, sorry, had some doors and stuff like that around town. Bear in mind, I come away from coaching, spending all the time in the gym, so I just needed to find some way to pay, like my mortgage and my bills and whatever else. So um, he'd fell out with his partner, and I basically bought his partner out of the security company. He would give me a little bit of money every month, enough to mm. cover, maybe cover the outgoings just about, but no money left over. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I was doing bits of coaching in between and just trying to find our way and. Um, we just started, I can't remember where we went from there. We tried a few different things. I'd actually borrowed money off people for different investments and ideas. It was just like, just just getting up every morning, me just like trying to fucking get out there and earn a living. Um, around the same time, sorry, I'd met but me mate, Brain Man Brian, who I've mentioned on every podcast. And again, fucking another absolute, like, I feel even now speaking, I mm. just feel so blessed that I've like, friends and people around me like these and Brian's like he won't mind me saying I think Brian uh, he's obviously a fair bit older than us and um, he had some problems himself mentally and stuff when he was younger and started studying the mind and basically as far as I know he healed himself and since then I think he's got an absolute passion and for knowledge for learning um, for understanding fucking human behaviour psychology studies quantum physics fucking anything literally anything mm. to do with like your mind the universe um, and he's a special special man um, learns every day reads every day like lives and breeds uh, basically your mind your thoughts mm. like fucking metaphysics um, everything just everything and he came in the gym as a sports and performance mind coach that was like the avenue he was going down basically the elf fighters with the mind and um, we come to the gym, I had a conversation with him for maybe an hour. And I've always been dead curious, uh, wondered what this is, what are we doing, who are we, this can't be. Look up the, the being old and look up at this at space. And I remember like really getting a feeling of anxiety, being like, shit, just let a meteor could just come in at us now. Or <laughs> is the aliens up there? And yeah. Like that, I've always had that in me, do you know what I mean? As I say, science is my favourite subject in mm. school. So I think that's definitely something what I've always had in um, Brian just started answering questions for me in an hour conversation, like, told me everything's energy. I was actually sitting on the couch like you are now. And he said, see that couch that you're sitting on? I was like, yeah, he said, that, it's, it's solid, isn't it? Whatever. I was like, yeah, I'm sitting on it. Yeah, he said, well, it's not. It's energy vibrating at a specific frequency. Everything's energy. And I was like, what do you mean? And he started to explain it to me. And really, it's just like, I kind of got a passion for wanting to understand it more and mm -hmm. learn about it and, the more I started to study all these things, even like the bits of psychology, what he put me on to and different people. And I started reading books and watching videos on YouTube and just basically studying anything to do with your mind. And the more I started to learn about my mind, I started to learn about myself, I started to look back on my life and my fighting career. And he came at the right time because in that period of time, I was in, in a hard time financially. But then I looked back to when I was a kid and there was absolutely nothing I'd ever needed that I weren't able to get. Mm. Whether it was from being five, knocking at people's doors and getting money off them for doing jobs around the house or walking down the street, checking phone boxes for 10p to go to the shop because I wanted to buy sweets and to being in school and wanting rock ball like all my mates, but my mum weren't in a position to buy them for us. So I go and buy my own. I was buying like BMXs and whatever anyone had, I needed it. When mm. in a case of I wanted it, I needed it. I had to have it. And I went out and got it in one way or another. So I start. Obviously, it was in a difficult time because I'd come away from fighting. I'd have my first son and I was skinned. Um, but there was never like, especially through speak, having them conversations with Brian, I was listening to this, the power and the secret or the old books, going for walks and just started to reprogram my mind intentionally, think like, and change my beliefs and mm -hmm. look back on my life and think, you know, everything just kind of made sense. Good and bad made sense. I realised a lot of the time I was having struggling in my life and having bad times was down to my mindset and where I was mentally, the people who were spending time around and mm. things like that. I was like, everything just started to click. And I was like fucking skinned. I was borrowing money off me, Mrs. dad at one point to pay the mortgage. But I had no problem with it whatsoever because I knew that there'd become, I'd come a point where I'd pay him back tenfold. 
you know what I mean? And that's like what I learned through Brian. That's basically everything in a nutshell. Like, but it's just putting it into practice. I, I was skint, but I weren't like down. I weren't mm. like fed up. I was actually grateful and, and happy and happy before I started. To, then things started to go well. I tried things, they didn't work. There was no like disappointment. So it was just like, right, Dave, come on, be <laughs> my partner, Dave, on to the next one. You know, we, we, we borrowed pe- money off people for investments and tried to use what we had mm. and they wouldn't work. And then I'd be in debt, but like the people who, um, I borrowed the money off would be people who were close to me who knew me and they knew that they, at some point I paid them back and mm-hmm. you know I, I did I, pay, I don't know anyone a penny and I always paid them back and again it was just a case of trying different things over and over again we started uh, you know, a couple of things went right we, we end up owing um, <coughs> being old money off a bar in town um, for security so obviously we had the security company and the guy who owned the bar at the time um, was in big debt. So the bar was going to get repossessed. But another good friend of mine worked for the company who owned the lease of the bar. Um, and he's one of, he's my business partner now. He's part of the security company with us now, actually. Mm. But he was just a friend at the time and a coast in, in Cowbond sometimes. And um, what was happening is the guy was losing the bar and had ran a bill up at the security. He went running the bar properly. He had his own other problems going on, whatever. And the bar was just basically went downhill. So I actually went through through the friend of mine, me and my partner that Eve went to the um the guys who own the lease and said to them, Look, we're in financial problems here. If he can't pay us, it's gonna fold our business. Um my friend, obviously you had coached in the gym, stood on for us and said the good lads and we must have presented ourselves well and they, they gave us basically a shot at running the bar, signed the lease mm. over to us and said, You can have a crack at it. Um you can have a crack at it and see how it goes. Obviously, if it doesn't work out, they'll they'll take it back off us. But they give us a shot at it anyway. To obviously, try and make the money back what we were about to lose. We um we ran the bar for a year. I had made two DJs. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Didn't even go out to town or nothing. Mm. I mean, all of a sudden, I was having to spend weekends in this bar. At the end of the bar, we're overseeing everything, running the bar. My partner Dave and um we ran the bar for like 12, 18 months and got it turned, turned it round, had it made, making money, paid all the debts off, paid the money back where it owed to us. Had all my mates just lads who were new calling in favours and getting lads who are new, like always in the bars and DJs and promoters and mm. they gave me some help. And within like 12, 18 months, we turned it round and sold it and made some good money off it and, and started investing that into property then and buying buy to lets and it's pretty much grown from there. Mm. Um now we're doing like big developments and stuff like that around Liverpool. Um, I, I set a restaurant up on Castle Street. I've obviously got a wake. Um, I've got a number of different businesses, mm. which which are all some are, some are winning, some are losing, especially with what's been going on the last mm. eighteen months. But I think the um, a lot of the stuff I'd learnt up until that point, and then meeting Brian, it was just a case of putting it into practice. And was there ever like a vision? Did you have like a this is this is what I want, or was it just 30, like an abundant 30, mindset? 30, I want no. At thirty, I made a written <clears throat> seven year plan. Okay, and it's it's changed along the way mm. in some ways, but like it's still learning. It's always been there, and I, I haven't like say checked in every so long to see where I am. I've just like um, I've just known where I am and what I want, mm. and and I've just naturally progressed towards that and worked towards that every day. I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in it's sound to have these big long term goals but at the same time you've got to just do your best every day and you know focus on kind of forget about it in a sense mm. um, because I think sometimes when you can keep focusing on the end goal especially if it's a big one when you have down times and things aren't going your way it's easy to, to give up or to, to lose belief in mm. faith so basically I have these long term goals and I just do I just do everything I can today to become do you have, little, do you have mini goals day. then if you like so I you might have a long-term short, goal and I'm yeah, working on it. Yeah, I said short-term. I've constantly got to be learning. Like mm. me, my passion, I love learning. Mm. I'm interested in the mind, obviously, because it's something that I've gained an understanding in and I've experienced a lot of rights and wrongs, goods and bads through. Um, in the past, when I didn't understand it, and I know basically everything in your mind everything. Like, mm. you create everything that comes from your mind. It's just the spark of an idea. It creates fucking airplanes. And mm. these are just things what someone's envisioned, which at the time didn't exist and people seen them as impossible, but... Nothing's impossible. Do you know what I mean? You hear the saying, if you can see and you can imagine it, you can create it. Yeah. And it's so true. And like, you know, I'm looking at people and I've used examples and watched examples of people who've come from absolutely nothing 
and use their experiences to motivate and inspire me to achieve my goals, knowing that if they can do it, then so so can I. You know what I mean? That, 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 mm-hmm. That's helped me massively along the way. But in terms of goals, I've had short-term goals. I've never gone like, at time would say using money as an example because it's a good example to use because obviously <coughs> it's, it's a physical something you can see. But I've never had a thing where, right, that's where I want to be financially in seven years. So in, in year one, I've got to be there. Year two, I've got to be there because what you find if in year one, you're not where you need to be, then you start to, it, it can be demoralising and it, and start questioning it, question and, and, start question it yeah, and, and losing belief and faith. So some people read the secret and think, I'll oh, just if I say I'm gonna be a millionaire. You might have a crap year in year one, but I'd yeah. have an absolutely smashing year in year two. So exactly. for me, the best thing is to focus to know what the end goal is, to put the intention out there, what I'm working towards. And action. But just take each day at a time yeah. and do everything more I need to do yeah. today because the days accumulate and that's I'm so big on habits. People who follow me on social media, you know, I'm up, you know, around five o'clock every morning. My kids get up at half seven, so I dedicate two hours. I learn something every single day. I'm obsessed with learning. Mm. I love learning. Learning's what gives me um gives me like the feelings of like fulfillment and I get loads of happiness and you know, mm. just just learning how learning how you um how your mind works and all these different things I'm studying, like we were speaking before, I'm you doing learning breath work and mm. I'm on Martin's meditation course last night. I'm constantly looking for things to like develop myself and learn with all the time, yeah. Me goals kinda used to be up until not so long ago, materialistic, and they were what I was working towards. But now it's like I've kind of got a lifestyle which, at the minute, I'm I'm happy with and I'm comfortable with it. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not in that that game of like upgrade my lifestyle and upgrade me income and doing that. Do you know what I mean? Just like looking for the next buying the next thing, the next big house. I'm like I'm happy where I am. My kids are happy mm. right now at this point. Um, no one might change at, at any time, but I'm happy just learning new things and. Learning and sharing, that's like, that's mm. what I experienced in Brazil as we were going back before. And the feeling what that gave me was amazing. And like, I, I love going in the schools and being able to help the, the kids. And I love doing the stuff we're doing at the beach. I use my social media. If it weren't for what I use my social media for, I wouldn't have it. It doesn't mm. serve any purpose for me life. I don't scroll nonsense. I don't care what Cathy's, aunties, uncles, fucking sisters, fellas being up to. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I use my Instagram with an intention to put quotes on, which I believe people relate to, which are relatable to me, which I learn from, which I think other people learn from. And I share them every morning and I get loads of feedback off people saying, wow, that's just what I needed to hear. That's helped me so much. People send me pictures of like, you know, the body. Mm. You know, someone will send me a DM and say, look, Mark, I listen to your podcast or, you know, you post on Instagram and I've turned my life around. I'm, you know, I'm adopting loads of these behaviours and ways and, I'm listening to what you're saying over routine and getting up early in the morning. The feeling that gives me is worth mm. more than any any, any material, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because it is made to think getting up early and, you know, winning your morning Yeah, is so big. But for, at times for me, mate, this year, I think it came like, it became a bit of a tick list. I just spoke to Martin about it. It became like unhealthy. Mm-hmm. I was doing it even if I was wiped out. I was getting up at five, even if I didn't have no sleep, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was up and doing it. So it became a bit little bit like that for me, mate. So I sort of just wound it back a little bit. I'm just started getting up at six, half six now. That's what I've started doing because that works for me. So we sort of had to find what worked for me with the busy living environment that that that, that, that I'm, I'm involved in. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, with working and doing packed and having your lifestyle with your kids, mate. But it's it's huge, mate. I think getting up a little bit earlier. Yeah, it doesn't have to be my time. routine. Obviously, I share exactly, my routine mate, yeah. what works for me. But you've got to just yeah. design and create a routine. Yeah. What works for you and what gives you what you need and to mm. put you where you need to be mentally. Yeah. Obviously, I exercise every morning. A big part of my the last 10 years of me uh, being who I am now is I watch motivational, inspirational, educational, informational fucking videos every morning. Mm. If I'm driving around in the car, I don't listen to music. I play these in the background, and even if I'm I'm not listening to them, they're still playing subconsciously in the back of my mind. Mm. So I might have listened to something in the morning, and, and I've really took note, and it's resonated with me, and I've been feeling whatever it is I've been watching. Mm. I play the same video all day. In the background, in my car, I'm driving around. You think sometimes you're not taking this information in because you're not paying attention to it. But it's like driving down the road past the McDonald's sign and then four hours later you're in McDonald's eating a burger mm. with no intention that day of going to McDonald's. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's there yeah. and you see it, you take it in. But just because you're not paying attention to it doesn't mean it's not being downloaded into mm. your subconscious. It's always you listening, mate, always isn't there, it? always yeah. listening, yeah. Yeah, true, yeah. mate. And that's been a massive part. Like, I know meditation's a powerful tool in terms mm. of 
you know, learning about yourself, learning about awareness and consciousness. And you know, basically for me, that's what meditation is, the practice of awareness. Yeah. Um, which doesn't necessarily mean you've got to <coughs> sit with your fingers like that and cross your legs. You can yeah. be meditating anywhere. I like to think I'm meditating, you know, a, a, a pretty big section of my day when I haven't got a busy day and I'm caught up in too many things. You know, if I have, do have days where I've got a bit of thinking time and free space in my mind, I, I'm, I find myself a lot in, you know, just fully aware of who I am, where I'm going, you know, hmm. basically meditating, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you're meditating, yeah. yeah. I think, like, it's training that awareness, mate, because we're talking about, obviously, where you place your energy and or where you place your attention where you place yeah. your energy. So when you're meditating, mate, you're gaining an awareness of where you, what your thoughts are doing, aren't you? So you can direct yeah. them. In a, in a place where you want them to go on, yeah. on things that you actually want to mm-hmm. manifest in your life. And there's the old saying, isn't it? Whatever you direct your attention, you direct your energy. Energy, where energy goes. Uh, attention goes, atten- energy where flows. Where attention goes, energy yeah. flows, yeah. And it's, it, it's so true, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it is, means. That, that's one of the great things about meditation. But for me, the, a big part of what's helped me is basically reprogramming my beliefs. I listen to the same videos, a lot of the same people over and over and over again. And it's stuff that a lot of it's common sense, but mm. we're just not taught it. Um, no, to do with attitude and discipline, and you know, even like thing empathy and things like that. These mm. are things that, like we know they're there, but we're, we're taught to be to compete against each other. And mm. you know, we're, we're, how we live today is based on science, fucking from 150 years ago. We've only got to look at technology and how to where it was 10 years ago to realise that really we should be evolving with science, but we're not. And, and in a sense, the way mobile phones and things are now. And technology, we don't know how to use it, so it's actually being used against us to sell us things and mm. to basically to, to, to take our attention. Where meditation, the practice of controlling your attention, mm. being aware of yourself. <coughs> and, so it's like that's why for me it's so important. That's why I get the kids doing it in the schools and things like that. It's mm. massively benefited me. I've done it for six, seven years, on and off, and was but was drawn to it through studying successful people. I'm watching and hearing so many neuroscientists and people like that speak about the benefits of it. Like even like Wim Hof and like people like that who've inspired me. Mm. Listening to them talk about it's what's made me realise it's. I've got no. Uh, it's not an option. I've got to do it. I have times and periods where I fall off it, and I don't do it as much as I'd like to. Um, but it's definitely something what I believe every single person on the planet should practice self-awareness because we live in a world which is designed to distract us. Mobile phones are designed by psych- psychiatrists, psychologists, mm. pe- people who understand your mind on a much higher level than I do to, to take your attention. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like you kind of, you're not in a battle, but, you know, I definitely think that, like some meditation and reprogramming your mind to watching certain things, replaying them over again, mm. repetition is is the key to them, keeping you mentally sane and, Keeping you be keeping you able to focus your attention on where you want to go, what you want to achieve, who you want to become, as opposed to being sucked into uh, distraction through like the devices and you know, all the stuff that's been going on the last eighteen months is a massive mm. distraction for a lot of people. But at the same time, it's pulled a lot of people out of the program, and obviously they're changing their lives now and realizing that they weren't happy the way they were living anyway. So, mm. you know, again, it's perspective, isn't it? Mm. You know I mean. I could talk about these type of things, mate, like for hours. Mm-hmm. I think I do. Everyone I talk to is usually self development. Um, or we're talking about like the likes of Bob Proctor, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Yeah. D. Martini. You know, I probably got a couple of them names from you, mate, when I listened to one of your old podcasts last year. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly, mate, I think a lot of people are, mate. A lot of people are waking up to it, aren't they? Massively, yeah. You only got to, to see the industry now, the wellness <laughs> industry. Everyone's like a mind coach now, aren't they? No, no, yeah. I've got nothing yeah. against that. If anyone's no. out there with the right intentions, for me, Evan, the about intention. If mm. you've learned a couple of things and they've worked for you and you want to share that with someone and good luck to you, mm. whether you get paid for it or you don't, that'll be dependent on how much value you add to someone else's life. If you're doing a good job and making people feel better, they'll want to pay you. I've mm. got no problem with that, whether you've got a qualification or you haven't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming from a good place, mate. I think a lot of it, isn't it? People Evan's doing mind intention. coaching, meditation, yeah. coaching. Evan's and intention. If you're going out to help people and it's to share information which which you've downloaded or you took from someone else or whatever and it's worked for you, then that's off to you. Go out there mm. and do that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So let's mark. I've, I've, I've loved this, mate, by the way. It's, um, we haven't got long left, though. I don't think, mate, too much longer left. Because we could actually, t- I could keep you in here for hours, yeah. mate. I'd lock you in here and we'd just talk. The same, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, let's talk about what's what's coming up for you, mate, in the future. You know, you know you've got to, got to wake. Yeah. Um, which is brilliant. You know, my family goes to there quite regularly, mate. 
Um, and you've obviously got other bits and bobs there. And I know you're a very busy man, mate. What can we expect to uh, be happening with you over the next, you know, over the, over the, over the next definitely six months? Definitely in a place here. where I'm starting to release things and wind down work-wise. Mm. Um, <clears throat> financially, I'm looking at ways to earn passive income. So, which passive income just means you earn money while you sleep, which basically means it's the maximum income with the least output energetically and time-wise. Because I'm realising now the most valuable things in the world through the likes of meditation and awareness and things like that is moments, it's time, it's being present with people and mm. you know, I'm leaning into more, that's where I want to go, that's where I want to be, I want to have time to myself, I want to be in control of my thoughts and not being dragged from pillar to post, answering 50 phone calls a day some days and you know, they're not all work, some of them are helping people and, and different things but I definitely want to free some space up in my own, you know, my own time. Mm. At the minute I work, Mondays are dedicated to work, Wednesdays are dedicated to work, I try and have a bit of like a self-development day on a Tuesday, so I study, I'll go and get like my hyperbaric, mm. uh, go to the hyperbaric oxygen chamber or go and get a massage or a float tank, do something which like is for me. But a lot of the time work gets in the way. Thursdays are dedicated solely to the school, so uh, the guy who works with Jimmy just say, Yo, I'm yours on a Thursday, whatever you want to send me, send me. Uh, Fridays, mornings, work, whatever I need to do. Friday afternoon, I spend that with my missus, and that's mm. that's that's Katie time dedicated to her. No mm. phone, no distractions, just like that's my missus' time. Weekends and with the kids, so I am in a really blessed like position. I'm in a gay position, mm. but at the same time, I'd like to have no obligations towards earning money. I just like my money to be looking after itself, me earning enough money to fund the lifestyle which I'm I'm happy and grateful for. Which doesn't mean a big fucking five million pound mansion or just means something I'm comfortable with mm. um, and I'm earning you know a lot more money than what I'm spending every month so I'm still in a position to give help other people help me mum people who are close to me do the stuff for a week um, and still be able to keep, put money away for the kids and invest if this something comes up or mm. and I'm not far off that position I'm definitely on, on I'm not there yet but yeah. I'm on the uh, I'm on the right track, but really it just started to quiet down, come away from things, start to do the things I love. I'd love to spend a couple of days a week studying, reading. Um, I love exercising. I'd say two, three times a day, Monday to Friday, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, saying seven days a week, and I've done for God knows how long. So mm. it's you know, maybe trying a few different different types of training and just having time time to myself and you know, maybe a bit more time freely to go and pick my mum up to go for something to eat or to see friends who mm. I've kind of lost touch with. They know I'm there for them, but Dad, mates kind of go to the back of the the list a little bit when it comes to spending time with them. You love them and you know that they're there and yeah. they're for you and you're there for them. But, you know, work has to take priority in your own family a lot of the time and mm. that's the position I'm in. So freeing up time, that's where I see myself going and mm. that's what's happening. Awesome, mate. Good stuff. Mm. So any final words, Mark, that you'd, that you'd like to say to anyone who does listen to the podcast? Um, obviously, you may be struggling, Mark. Um, who may need a, a, a helping hand um, you know who, who watches your stuff is there anything you'd like to say to them or any yeah. advice you've got mate on people to listen to or what to do to take the necessary steps to, to find I think them the biggest problem is a lot of people know what they should be doing yeah like they know and then in a sense a lot of people now are on this awareness train so they're starting to become aware and the big yeah. thing I'm hearing, like oh, I'm aware of it I'm aware of it that doesn't make it okay because mm. actually being aware of it and not doing it can be worse mm. If you're aware that you've got problems, just take one tiny step in the right direction. One little bit of progress in, in any way. It doesn't have to be change your whole life. That's what people go like, right, I'm going to go from sleeping in and whatever to um, waking up at five and meditating yeah. and doing this. One extreme to the other. It's not sustainable. It's you, You're literally changing your life overnight when you condition, your beliefs never ever being conditioned and your behaviour's evidence. It's habitual. It takes time and it's hard. You're like it's, It can be painful as well, guys, mm-hmm. you'll know be painful changing and becoming mm. someone else but just take that first step stop procrastinating take that first step whether it's a cold shower it's getting up a little bit earlier it's looking into a practice of meditation just one thing at a time and if it's you know if it's one you implement one thing every couple of weeks eventually you'll get there but it's the, the first step is always the big one i've had messages off people who've been unhappy and whatever in themselves and on unhealthy they came to the beach and the message i've had off them really brought me to tears because I've seen the impact it's had on someone and they've just made that first step, just getting up early in the morning, being there. So, no, that, that, that's pretty much it. Mm. Stop procrastinating. If you know what you've got to do, all this awareness, bollocks, 
pack it in. <laughs> Don't be aware of it and not do it. If you're aware of it, then then take the action because you will not regret it, I promise you. Mm. And who should we be listening to, Mark? Uh, Apart from you on Instagram, who else? Martin Bone, legend. Uh, Fitness-wise and all that, Luke Powell, said fast. Mm. Callum Webb, Holly, legends. My partner, Diane, who I've uh, got away with. Absolutely amazing woman. The, 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 the list endless. Mm. Follow me and, and follow some of the, the people who I post and speak mm. to. And You know, I, I, I put a thing on every now and again where I list all the people who took to go on YouTube. YouTube's an absolute fucking asset to anyone. Yeah. You know, um, the amount of videos and people I've got downloaded and I watch them every day. That definitely helps. Program your mind. Fill your brain with something positive first thing in the morning. And it'll change your life. Mm. That's it. Boss. Mark. We're going to wrap up, brother, yeah? Cool. Thank you very much Thank for coming you, on, mate. Been, uh, been a pleasure. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. Boss.